Watching Breakthrough News, and this is the Freedom Side. Happy to have you all back with us. I am Eugene Perrier, one of your hosts, and I am here alongside my intrepid co host, as always, Rania Kalik. Rania, great to be back with you. Always great to be back on with you, Eugene. Excellent. Well, certainly glad to hear that. Uh, plenty for you here on the show. Uh, as always, we'll be talking Haiti, Texas. Kenya and its relationship to Haiti, ridiculous hearings in the U.S. Congress, the ongoing genocide in Gaza. So we've got a lot for you. Pack show. You're here on YouTube, of course. So I say that just to remind you that you should go ahead and hit subscribe and then make sure you hit the bell so you can get the alerts for the things you subscribe to because we have all sorts of great content coming out all the time about all of the issues I just mentioned and many, many more, including a number of in-depth interviews uh, on Dispatches, Rania Kalik's show. So you can only get all the access to all the things if you're both subscribed, hitting the alerts, and Rania, what else do you need to do to get access to all Breakthrough News content? Well, Eugene, you can become a Breakthrough News member and access exclusive content, as Eugene just said, by going to patreon.com slash Breakthrough News. So important if you're able to, to support independent media at this crucial point in time. Um, become a member of Breakthrough News. You'll not only be helping to support all of our excellent journalism here, um, if I do say so myself, but you'll also get access to exclusive content, including parts of my show Dispatches, as well as Eugene's uh, monthly uh, Africa. Uh, sorry, Eugene. What? Do you, sorry, I'm like losing Seminar. my words right now. I want to remind everybody there's a time zone difference here, and it is Thursday night at 10 p.m. my time. Don't don't shrug your shoulders. We have to be respectful of time differences. Those of you watching from not America know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, anyways, so my, sometimes I get a little slow at this time. I'd like to see Eugene on air at 10 p.m. I'll also add, yeah, go ahead, Eugene, make your comments. If, if you, ahead, if you want to do this show at 10 p.m., I'm with it. You know, let's let's see how it goes. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Like, who wants to see Eugene at 10 p.m.? Let's let's see let's see how awake and sharp he is. I'm a hundred percent. Listen, I'm with it. Listen, that once a month I'm on the radio in Chicago. By the way, from midnight to one a.m. All right. Radio is different because you could just like be on your earphones. You could be doing dishes. Well, I hope you're not doing dishes, but you could like just be chilling on the couch. This is on camera. It's a little bit different. It takes a lot more than just radio, Eugene. Okay. Well, we'll see about that. Midnight <laughs> Try to excuse madness. Excuse my misspeaking. Anyways. Patreon.com slash Breakthrough News, you guys. Uh, become a member so you can hear me and Eugene banter uh, dad jokes. And then also you can access really cool merch, by the way, such as this really cool mug, which I absolutely love, the front and the back of it. Breakthrough News merch. There's also T-shirts. There's so much fun stuff. Um, and then I also want to remind everybody, my favorite thing to remind everybody, which is if you are watching live or watching after the fact, please make sure you smash that like button. Where's it at, Matt? Smash Do we have that. it? Like button. <laughs> Eugene, come on. Can I get like a kind reaction from you on that? I like it. Listen, if you can, ah, look at Eugene's fake smile. Wow. Okay. I don't know how I feel about that. Well, anyways, Eugene, I'll, what can I'll I let say? you take it from there. I, as, as, <laughs> as long as, as long as our viewers like it, I'm all for it. And as long as they're hitting the like button, then it's all worth it. Uh, so yes, make sure that you go to patreon.com slash breakthrough news, hit subscribe there just below your YouTube screen, hit the bell so that you can get the alerts for the things you subscribe to. And we are about to be off to the races. So you might want to take this time to alert anyone, however you so choose, release a carrier pigeon, bang a drum, let them know that we are here on the Freedom Side on Breakthrough News. And we've got a lot for them. So whoever is following you can follow us. But let's just jump right. No, go ahead, Rania, please. Oh, no, I just said yes. I was just, you know, validating what you said. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> always good to have the support. 
Uh, but, uh, let's just jump right into it and turn to our first topic here. And we want to return to the issue of Texas, which is right at the center of U.S. politics now as there's an ongoing roiling debate over border policy and I think everything that is underneath that. But of course, there's a lot of history and a lot of roots to all these things and a lot of future repercussions from that history and our contemporary reality. And to discuss all of that and more, we are honored to be joined here by Dr. Gerald Horn, who's a professor of history and African-American studies at the University of Houston and the author, among other things, of The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery and Jim Crow and the Roots of U.S. Fascism. Dr. Horn, thank you so much for being back with us. Thank you for inviting me. Well, happy to have you here. Uh, Texas, you know, Martin Dyes, one of the early heads of the House on American Activities Committee, George W. Bush, Abbott, uh, Nelson Bunker Hunt, who is a big funder of the John Birch Society. I mean, it seems wherever you look, uh, Texas is is a cradle of a lot of a reactionary American history. Uh, why do you think that is? What's behind that, Dr. Horn? Well, first of all, Texas is so large. It's the largest state in the lower 48, surpassed only in territory by Alaska. Texas also was an independent country from 1836 to 1845. Recall that it seceded from Mexico in 1836, not least because Mexico had moved under a president of African descent, speaking of Vicente Guerrero, to abolish enslavement. The settlers led by Sam Houston, Stephen L. Austin, and others who ostentatiously affixed their names to leading cities were in having that, they seceded. But alas, they could not withstand the abolitionist pressure from revolutionary Haiti and their allies in London, and they crawled into the Union by 1845. But then by 1860, 1861, uh, Texas was objecting to the United States, not unlike the grounds on which it is objecting today. What I mean is that Texas felt the United States in 1860, 1861 could not prevent their labor force, speaking of enslaved Africans, from fleeing south of the border. Thousands upon thousands, many of us know about following the North Star to abolition in Canada. But of course, the, there was a, a path to abolition in Mexico as well. And so because of that, Texas was a leader in the so-called Confederate States of America, which waged war on the United States in order to ensure that uh, Africans would be enslaved forevermore and were defeated. Uh, however, now, fast forward to 2024, you see that Texas is objecting once again to a question of labor. That is to say, they're saying that the United States is not able to prevent labor from south of the border, particularly Mexican labor, from coming into the United States of America. And they see that as a reason for friction and conflict. And therefore, if you go to Eagle Pass, Texas, abutting the border with Mexico, you'll find not only conflicts, dangerous conflicts between the U.S. Border Patrol and uh, armed official Texans, not to mention unofficial armed Texans, uh, including right-wing truckers, the so-called Army of God, the state of Idaho, a red state in good standing, has sent uh, its officials to the border as well. So it's a very inflamed situation that we must pay attention to. Dr. Horn, I'm really I really appreciate that you're framing it around around that because you know when we talk about the anti-immigrant movement in the US, the far right movement in the US, I mean the various militias that make it up, the way it grew under Donald Trump and was empowered under Donald Trump, and the fact that you've repeatedly had even US homeland security say over and over again that actually the biggest threat domestically in the US is in fact the armed far right. Um, whether it's lone wolves or whatever they call them, or these more organized forces, when we see what's happening right now in Texas, how does that feed into that growing movement? I mean, you also have this happening in a presidential election year uh, when Donald Trump, you know, uh, just like last time around, he seeks to uh, gain attention and support and to rile up his base using this sort of anti-immigrant uh, racist hate speech uh, that, you know, that's very much, I think, uh, attached or in line with the sort of sentiment we see we see rising in Texas. I guess I just said a lot there, but can you just unpack what this means about the empowerment of the far right? I was surprised to see that not get the attention it deserved uh, as this Texas standoff has played out. 
Well, recall that it was just a few years ago that in El Paso, Texas, which by some estimates has the largest predominantly Mexican-American majority city in the United States of America, that you had an armed right winger who came to Walmart and began shooting people down like they were dogs. He was, of course, inflamed by this idea that supposedly uh, people from south of the border were streaming into Texas. That was a reason that led, he said, uh, to his uh, armed, one-man armed uprising. But then again, I must focus attention on these right-wing truckers who have an inglorious history. Recall that in Canada a year or two ago, that in objection to so-called COVID restrictions, uh, they stormed into Ottawa and were seemingly bent on dislodging the Liberal Party government of Prime Minister Trudeau. And once again, you see armed truckers uh, streaming into Eagle Pass, Texas. And for those with longer memories, you might recall what happened in 1973 in Santiago de Chile with the overthrow of Salvador Allende, the elected socialist president. One of the elements in that overthrow were once again right-wing truckers. So this is a very uh, serious situation, and it's also taking place in the context of a very important political economic development. The U.S. press just reported the other day that Mexico has surpassed China as a major source of goods and exports. That is to say that uh, there is an increasing integration of the economies of the United States and Mexico, which should not be surprising for those of us who followed the trajectory of NAFTA, the North American, uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. And so as a result of that, you see laborers uh, flocking to the border, not only from Mexico, but from Central America, in fact, from all over the world. 60 Minutes did a piece the other day talking about uh, labor from Africa and Asia uh, flocking to the Texas-Mexico border. And this is helping to inflame xenophobic sentiments. It's helping to inflame anti-immigrant sentiments. You might have seen the rather startling video from New York City where Curtis Lewa of the so-called Guardian Angels yes. attacked a, a man on the streets of New York while being broadcast from Fox News, who he said was an undocumented worker, but actually uh, he had just happened to be somebody from the Bronx. So for those of you who feel that because you're not an immigrant, you may be able to escape the wrath of this right wing. That incident from New York City just a moment or two, just a day or two ago, uh, tells you something different. No, very, very well taken point. And that was quite, quite the video uh, and quite the context. And, and, you know, one of the other things that I think is notable about this in many ways is the way sort of this kind of border politics is used to shape a particular U.S. nationalism. And you've got a lot of the same people who are saying we need to militarize the border, saying we should be launching drone strikes into Mexico, invasions, and sort of pitting the two against each other. And it sort of feels like there's also a historical link here, too, to the emergence of Texas, this dichotomy between a more progressive government in Mexico that, you know, you know, most Americans don't know this now, is appealing to Americans to, you know, join with Mexico to push a more progressive policy in Central America. Uh, and then you have this concentrated sort of cradle of reaction there, uh, right there on the border, sort of pushing things. So I wonder just how you think this relates to how sort of the people opposed to this right wing drive in America should be relating to this question of, of U.S. nationalism. Well, obviously, this question of so-called U.S. nationalism is a clear and present danger to civil liberties and to civil rights. Uh, particularly if you look back at history, if you reel back to your introductory remarks, uh, we know that, for example, from Texas, you had some of the most significant support of McCarthyism. Matter of fact, Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin was seen as the third senator from Texas because he was supported not only by Nelson Bunker Hunt, um, but also uh, by other forces as well uh, who were part of the a right-wing oil men cadre. And those right-wing oil men cadre are still in the driver's seat politically uh, in Texas. Uh, Texas is a red state. It is a state where the Republican Party has been ruling for over three decades, continuously ho holding every top state office. The Attorney General, Ken Paxton, escaped impeachment 
despite uh, a passel of misdeeds. Uh, you might recall that he's considered to be a close comrade of Donald J. Trump as well. And so I think that for those in your audience who are concerned about the trajectory of the United States of America and concerned about the growth of the right wing, you certainly should focus your attention on Texas, because if you look at what happened on January 6, 2021, uh, you'll find that a disproportionate percentage of the insurrectionists actually came from Texas, even though uh, they had further travel, say, than Virginians or Marylanders, uh, et cetera. So this is a very dangerous state that I'm speaking about, and we need to focus on it. So what's what's the answer here? I mean, I don't I'm not yeah, I, obviously there's not enough time to really get into how we fix it, but we can at least start. And I also want to add that, you know, I know Texas is seen as this far right place, but it's also not a very democratic place. And I don't mean big D Democrat. I mean, small D Democrat democratic place like it's uh, there's all these voter suppression laws in Texas. It's there's there's a system built in that almost guarantees you're going to have Republicans be in charge forever. Um, So I'm just curious if you could speak to the fact that Texas is really like in the hands of the far right politically. We're not just talking about movements on the ground. We're talking about elected officials. The governor is extremely far right himself. Uh, It's a it's it's a pretty frightening place politically. Uh, And I'm just curious, like, what does that mean for the country moving forward? Oh, it it bodes ill for the country moving forward. For example, just a few weeks ago um, in Houston, which is not considered to be a citadel of the ultra right wing, there was a pro-Nazi demonstration with swastikas and all the rest. You can go check it out in the Houston Chronicle, the daily mainstream newspaper in uh, Houston. They had two slogans, uh, make America, quote, white again, unquote, and down with Jewish supremacy, believe it or not. And this is typical of the state of Texas. And by the way, uh, the right wing is pushing to place secession on the ballot. Another echo of 1860, 1861. Uh, Thus far, they have been thwarted, but many of us do not expect them to be thwarted forever. Uh, You mentioned Governor Abbott. Uh, He was recently out of the country, uh, touring the world. Now, we were told that he was touring in part to drum up investments for the state of Texas. But there are those who suspect that just like 1860, 1861, uh, he's seeking to drum up support for secession. Now, of course, uh, officially, he has not come out in favor of secession. But recall that Nikki Haley, the presidential hopeful on the GOP aside, uh, she made some rather curious comments a week or two ago and fundamentally interpreted as endorsing secession. And, uh, and of course, she had to walk it back. So uh, this is a very parlous and dangerous situation that is dangerous not only for folks like myself who live in this benighted state, but ultimately, a la 1860, 1861, could provide a clear and present danger to others who do not live in Texas. No, I think that's a very well taken point and seeing, you know, whatever 25 states that backed Abbott uh, in the this broader border standoff and the fact that he himself referenced the importance of remembering the Alamo when he was passing gun laws just before Uvalde. All very well taken points. Well, as always, really, really appreciate you being willing to join us here, Dr. Horn. I can't recommend higher the counter revolution of 1836, Texas slavery and Jim Crow and the roots of U.S. fascism. I'm like a third of the way through. Fantastic. As always, Dr. Gerald Horn, thank you so much for joining us here on the Freedom Side. Thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. Well, Eugene, it sounds like uh, Lebanon's a better place to be right now than uh, (laughs) Texas. I mean, no, no, I I really, I I I hear you. Tongue in cheek, but maybe not that tongue in cheek in in a weird way. I also feel like a lot of this does get really downplayed in the sense that, um, Everyone's like, ah, Texas is just crazy. Like, it'll be fine, you know? And it's that actually sounds very frightening, what he just <laughs> mentioned. Yeah, I mean, it really – it's like the Border Patrol is already so – militarized against immigrants, all these other things that if you feel like you have to be like more hardcore (laughs) than the border patrol, like it does really just make you wonder. And, you know, part of the thing that they were actually, um, you know, debating over was this issue of the razor wire and people are getting caught in it. People are being hurt. I mean, there was, I don't know. I I don't really know the provenance of it. There's allegations that someone drowned, I think, but then Texas was pushing back on that. But you can really just see that the sort of, you know, death cult 
of this hardcore militarized border politics is coming. And as I said before, and I feel like this is just notable, you know, none of this is working. I mean, for people who, you know, for somehow think this is like, oh, yeah, we're getting tough on the border. None of this is working. In fact, every year they get, quote, unquote, tougher on the border and more people keep coming because the relationship to people coming is not the level of danger uh, in terms of crossing the U.S. border, but the level of desperation in terms of an ability to provide for themselves and for their families. And so if you can't make a living and might starve on the street or you're facing, you know, violence, uh, violence against women, which a lot of people who are coming to this country are uh, fleeing from in various parts of the world, so on and so forth. You really don't have a choice. You know, you're either going to die slowly where you are or you're going to die coming here. But at least if you get here, you'll have the opportunity to do something that, quite frankly, no matter who you are, everyone would do if it came down to eating and surviving, um, no matter what people claim to say at the end of the day. If they were in the same shoes, I think they'd do the same thing. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, a lot to watch, a lot to follow here, and a lot that will continue to develop in 2024. <laughs> and this it's just amazing to even think this is where we are but we are shout out to Nestor Gonzalez for your donation appreciate it just a reminder to everyone that you can donate uh, just below the screen one time donation in addition to becoming a member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news now we want to turn our attention to Haiti which is being swept by a wave of protest and a ongoing attempt to occupy the country yet again. And we are very, very honored to be joined for this conversation by Dr. Jamima Pierre, who's a professor of global race at the Institute of Race, Gender, Sexuality, and Social Justice at the University of British Columbia and a member of the Black Alliance for Peace. Jamima, thanks so much for being back with us. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it almost feels like, uh, you know, when we were talking in 2020, uh, you know, here we have this president uh, Prime Minister, excuse me, who is just a, not elected by anyone. Huge protests sweeping the country. All sorts of rumors, you know, of armed uprisings, invasions. I mean, it just feels like Haiti is on the brink. I, I mean, does it feel like Henri will be, uh, Dr. Ariel Henri, who's the Prime Minister, de facto Prime Minister, will be pushed out of power? What could come next? I, those are big questions, I know, but uh, maybe where we can start and take it where it goes. Yeah, definitely. But you have to remember that Henri was not chosen by the people, was handpicked by the core group, which occupies Haiti right now. Uh, but before we get to that, I think it's more important to also talk about February 7th as an important date, which is why there's so many protests. Um, 38 years ago in 1986, February 7th was when the Haitian people kicked out Duvalier after a 30 year uh, dictatorship and, you know, France sent the plane to get him and sent him back, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to France where he lived out his life in wealth, you know, in wealth and luxury. Um, and so people remember that. And then soon after, um, the U.S. allowed, you know, a military government to take over until we had the first democratically elected president in Jean-Bertrand Aristide with the Lavalas movement in 1990, right? And so that's what's happening. Uh, so people remember February 7th. They also remember February 7th because even though the U.S. imposed Ayo Henri on the folks, Ayo Henri signed the December 21st agreement that he would be only in power for 30 months and that he would step down February 7, 2024. This is what you have right now. People are saying, you know, the Haitian people, they can only take so much, as you know. And it's the protest that tells you that this is a powerful and, and, and resistant group of people because they'll, they'll, Henri, they, they let him play for these 30 months and then they're like, they're like now on February 7th, we need to leave. And so I want people to know as these terrible images, I know the racist images that people get about Haiti and always are talking about Haiti's gang violence is about to fall apart. Just remember that Haiti is under occupation. It's been under occupation since 2004 when the U.S. invaded and kicked out our president and the U.N condone that occupation uh, invasion by occupying Haiti with the core group and the military force. And so that's what that's the thing that we have to remember. So all of this has happened. The entire Haitian state has been dismantled under this occupation, which is why there's no president. There are hardly any senators. There's nothing because they uh, they created that situation then to come in and then say Haiti's problem is a gang problem as opposed to in a problem of imperialism and ongoing U.S. and U.N. control of the country. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, what 
is the situation now in terms of, you know, before everybody was talking a lot about Kenya is going to intervene and Kenya is going to go to Haiti and the U.S. was trying to put this sort of like African face on intervention in Haiti. What's transpired since? Well, uh, one thing I think the people protesting, we have to give them credit to get the Kenyan on the ground protesting as well, so, so that then we had a, a Kenyan group that challenged this, uh, the release of the police force to Haiti. So the Supreme Court of Kenya blocked it in the fall and then blocked it again in December um, and said that they would give a final ruling in January, which they did um, a couple of weeks ago. They gave a final ruling that it's against Kenya's constitution to send um, police to Haiti. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know, Ruto, who's, you know, the, the, the comprador uh, for Europe and the U.S. is saying no matter what, he's going to send this, um, this police force because he's being paid. And just yesterday, or I think the day before, you had Kenyan uh, official meeting with Jamaican officials in Japan on the sideline to talk about this military operation that um, that Kenya is supposed to lead with help from Jamaica and Bahamas. Remember, just two days ago, the U.S. issued a travel warning against Jamaica and Bahamas because of they ha they have violence. And so imagine this: these are the same people that are being sent um, to Haiti. So now they're challenging it in the court. But I have to say, what the court said that they needed to show the government in Haiti that um, that there's a bilateral agreement between the government of Haiti and the government of Kenya. But Haiti's government is not legitimate. So whatever agreement that is signed by an illegitimate government is null and void. And that's what people have to know. So whatever they do is going to be illegal no matter what. You know, there's so many dynamics here and so many shifting sands. One of the, I think, more interesting things, at least for those of us who have been following Haiti for some time, we've seen uh, uh, Mr. Philippe return as a, you know, quote unquote revolutionary leader. Uh, this BSAP militia that has having gunfights now with the police in Port-au-Prince, uh, but also sort of tied with him saying that they're going to launch this, you know, quote unquote revolution. Uh, I, I mean, I wonder what you think about the political scene like this, because it really does seem we're seeing a lot of sort of older figures with a long history in Haiti reemerge but at least attempting to have a very different sort of guise uh, in terms of our current moment. Yeah, uh, people have to remember Guy Philippe was funded by the CIA. He admitted as much, was trained in the Dominican Republic um, from 2000 to 2004 um, when they, you know, they were launching attacks. His paramilitary group were launching attacks to destabilize the Aristide government, the legally uh, and democratically elected president. And so people used to call him, you know, the the rebel, you know, the 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 uh, resistance to Aristide. That's how the Western media portrayed him. But they used him as a ruse to, in order for the U.S. Marines to go in and physically remove Aristide from power. And then soon after that, of course, the U.S. turned on him and put him in prison um, um, for drug trafficking, of all things. And so he was in the U.S. prison. He was sentenced to nine years in U.S. prison, and then they released him early. And everybody's shocked that they sent him back to Haiti. And so some people think he's turned a new leaf, that he's about to lead a revolution, and that remains to be seen. As far as I'm concerned, he's a you know, he should be tried for treason um, for the, 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 the coup d'etat that happened in 2004. And what's asked What's interesting as well is like, you know, people keep saying gangs. What's happening in Haiti is a bunch of paramilitary. The people who are armed are former Haitian military, former police. The guns are coming from the U.S. and from the Dominican Republic, funded by the biggest paramilitary groups are right near the U.S. embassy. What's fascinating is that this BSAP group, which was an environmental group that has been armed, they have all these new arms, these cars. You're wondering where the money's coming from, but the police will fight against them, but not the other groups that are terrorizing the neighborhoods um, um, in Haiti. So it's a terrible political situation. And I do think the point is to actually make the place look terrible to say that there's nothing else we can do but send military to Haiti. Mind you, they're not offering anything else to Haiti. They're not offering, they're not trying to block, they're not doing the embargo that China and Russia suggested in the UN Security Council. And there's no arms embargo. They're not helping military aid. They're not trying to start schools. The only solution they always have for Haiti is a violent one. And that tells you everything you need to know about the racist 
the racist aspect of, 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 of U.S. Um, uh, imperialism in the country? You know, uh, we're in an election year and I hate to make everything about the horse race. Uh, so I don't mean to do that here, but obviously there's a Republican and a Democrat running against running against each other, as is always the case. Um is there a difference between these two parties on Haiti? Has anything changed under Joe Biden, you know, since Donald Trump was president? <laughs> and, you know, I'm being a little don't, sneaky asking that question, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I heard something the other day that, you know, Democrats and Republicans are two cheeks of the same, you know, um, <laughs> they're there, right? And, um, and when it comes to Haiti, that is so clear. I mean, look, the, the, the difference between Biden and Trump is that Biden has deported more Haitians than Trump could ever uh, deport in his first, you know, months um, in, in, in Haiti, um, um, in, in office, and, and, and that Biden has, been, has continued everything forward. Obama was deporter in chief. Um, Trump you know, did title Title Forty Two in, in the U.S. Mexico border remain Mexico policies that Biden carried on. So Biden has actually been much more draconian in his policies towards Haiti, and I think part of the part of it. But the good thing is because U.S. empire is faltering. We have to read read this this way, because ten years ago it would have been so easy to just send a, a few U.S. Marines and occupy Haiti. That's what they did in 2004. Now they're scared to send their military. They can't find anybody to do the dirty work. I mean, for him to go all the way to Kenya, remember, they tried to get Brazil, they tried to get Canada, they tried to get Mexico to lead um, this mission in Haiti. And it's been two years since they've tried to get a, an, a, a military force into Haiti, and they haven't been able to. So to me, the difference is the weakness of the Biden administration when it comes to foreign policy in general, um, not being able to have this go on. And I also want to talk about these pictures that you're showing, because the trash in the streets are people actually trying to block the, the, the police cars and, you know, the government cars that are terror, terrorizing them. So neighborhoods have actually put up, you know, sandbags trying to block the paramilitary groups. They put the trash in the street to prevent cars from going through. So I hope people see that because, you know, I, I, the images around Haiti are always so dis, uh, disturbing and painful for me to see, but I also want to contextualize them. No, I think that's that's critically important, and I, you, it, it's amazing the lack of context or forget context, even mention of the popular resistance. I mean, even if they say there are protests, it's like there's just people randomly out in the streets or something like that. And I, it feels like that's another element of this that is actually important. I mean, from the protests to even people taking their own security into their own hands in certain circumstances and taking back their neighborhoods, there's a lot of self organization happening on the ground in Haiti that I feel is a very important part of what's happening in the process right now. Absolutely. And I think if you listen to Haitian radio, it's a lot of young people saying, you know, there, there was a Boacale movement, which, um, which was actually going after the gang, you know, the paramilitary groups, um, neighborhoods coming together and, you know, doing their own justice. And that's the only time you had Ariel Henry and the police stop the people mm. from going after these paramilitary groups. So the only time they come out is to actually keep the people from protesting and taking care of their own. But the people realize that they can do their own thing. Look, my mom was in Haiti just last week, you know, and she flew in from in the north, went into her hometown. And she's, you know, what she's saying is like people are protecting their communities all over. And so people can get around, people can do what they need to do. But the other thing I want to point out very specifically about what's going on on the ground, what people realize is that these paramilitary groups are only attacking the poor, the masses in the poor neighborhoods. You notice they're not attacking the banks. They're not attacking the elite areas. No rich people are getting kidnapped. No fire is being in, done in like, you know, gas stations and, and, and um, grocery stores. So what you see is that the elite is working together with the UN, the US, and this unelected and illegal government to keep the people down because the whole notion about gangs and so on and so forth is the same discourse that the U.S. has been using against Haiti since the early 1900s to justify um, um, intervention. And so, but the, 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 
the people, the government will use the term gang to, 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 to any protest, they'll call them gangs. And so everybody falls into this language. But let's remember how racist and terrible and historically inaccurate that, that term is. But people are on the ground. They're, they're, they're ready for revolution. And, and I, you know, it, let's remember how the other Haitian revolution happened. And so anything is bound to happen at this point. And, and my, my, my uh, solidarity is with the people on the ground fighting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you showed a great picture, by the way, in your social media that you have uh, Haitian revolutionary folks holding up Palestinian flags uh, and standing exactly. with Palestine despite all of this, which I thought was really, really cool. Well, I appreciate you as always, Dr. Jamima Pierre from the University of British Columbia and very importantly, the Black Alliance for Peace for joining us here on the Freedom Side and helping us sort through it all. Thanks so much for having me. Mm-hmm. Well, Eugene, I think you once told me that Haiti's kind of like uh, Gaza. It's like there, there's, there's no one who really comes to its defense. Um, it's just that place that the U.S. can keep punching, keep punching, keep punching. And then whenever anything blows up, it's like, oh, yeah, that's just how they are there. Yeah. Let's not you know, talk about like the bigger. And unfortunately, it's like the ticket to quote unquote you know, showing that you have responsible stewardship of the international community. And that's, you know, Brazil thought they were going to get a seat in the Security Council by fronting an invasion. That didn't happen. You know, Kenya, I'm sure, has been promised quite a number of things. Undoubtedly, that will never happen. Uh, There's always some attempt, you know, to try to convince people to get involved because this time this is the right one. And this is how you show that you're a responsible actor in dealing with this out of control country. Um, But one thing that there's no discussion of right now, but I think it's important, I'll just say it and then we'll move on, uh, that a lot of people are not talking about coming up next year, basically, but the debate is this year is the at least potential reauthorization of the HOPE Act and the HELP Act, which are these so-called free trade agreements that are basically what locks in the sweatshop economy of Haiti, where people are making things that are being shipped to the United States. There's no tariffs on them. And of course, people are being paid atrociously. And this is one of the main things that the U.S., especially in the whole West and you know other parts of the world are getting out of Haiti, the super, super cheap labor. And that's going to come up for reauthorization. Now, it looks like Congress is probably likely going to reauthorize it again. When people say, why are people coming from Haiti? Uh, you know, what can we do to turn it around? Is there any way to, you know, do X, Y, and Z? Well, the number one way would be to empower Haitians to actually do the things that they want to do to develop their own industry, to develop their own agriculture, and all these different things. But that actually requires a totally different framework of U.S. policy. So there's no conversation at all about what U.S. policy uh, is towards Haiti, how that relates to that. So that's something to watch that's sort of two things, the HOPE Act and the HELP Act. They come at different times. But another important element, by the way, uh, of those two acts is that it forces Haiti to have these you know, so-called free market governments um, and to only focus on private business and to not develop state capacity. So anyway, there are things that can be done and can be acted on for people here in the United States if you want to make a change uh, on Haiti. Rania, we got you back there. Yeah, sorry, my camera battery wasn't plugged in, you guys, but it's all good now. I just plugged it in. It's okay. It said battery. You were just, you were just yeah. testing how much we were paying attention. I appreciate. Yeah, that. well, I just sometimes I just don't feel like I'm here. I feel like no one sees me, and I feel sort of invisible. So wow. now I know that's not true because everyone noticed I was gone. Yes, well, I was every, actually still know, here by people, the way. If you my if you see Rania, hit that like button so that she knows that you really care. So. <laughs> Smash that like button. Smash that like <laughs> On that note, uh, we want to turn <laughs> the page here Every time. Uh, <laughs> to Kenya, where, of course, you have heard, as we, uh, uh, Dr. Pierre just laid out for us very well, uh, the government of Kenya trying to get in on this uh, occupation, this neocolonial occupation of Haiti. But the people of Kenya, especially the Communist Party of Kenya, have been standing up against this. And we are very, very honored to be joined here on the show by Booker Amole, who is the National Vice Chairperson and National Organizing Secretary of the Communist Party of Kenya. Booker, thank you so much for being back with us. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, it's my pleasure to be on the Breakthrough News today, especially to discuss uh, this important um, uh, where one of the African countries will want to send, uh, you know, put some ground to Haiti. So it's important for us to probably give uh, the Kenyan and the African perspective and uh, probably how it will affect, um, you know, the debates, but also the actual uh, uh, 
um, between the global north and the global south. Thank mm-hmm. you very much. No, well, thank you. And I mean, maybe let's just start here. I mean, why do you think the government of Kenya has gotten involved in this? Why would an African country want to be involved in the occupation of Haiti? It's important um, that we understand that the it's not the it's not the Kenyan people supporting this move for Haiti, but this, this is a policy by a reactionary government. It's actually a lead people. In fact, um, uh, to say it is a neocolonial government. And um, Kenya, the Kenya government, uh, since independent, uh, has had uh, such uh, anti people policies. Maybe just to put you in history, remember Kenya was one of the countries that the wrong side of history during the apartheid in South Africa. And um, remember also Kenya was an outpost for the Zionist regime to attack this neighbor, Uganda. So uh, we've had a situation where Kenya is considered mainly by the imperialist countries or Western governments of their key allies in the region. And now, when you look at the issue of um, not Haiti, we must not look at it in isolation because the government, the current government, uh, President Trudeau's administration, is even more reactionary than the previous governments. And they have coined um, uh, what they are calling economic diplomacy. You know, for them, it is what we can get when we relate with other people. And they are looking at this uh, to Haiti as one of the missions that will be able, because they, they, they are actually targets that have been put aside, you know, for this work. Unfortunately, the ruling class is going to get from this um, United Nations Council's um, legal approve, uh, approval of this mission will not be used to be to the majority of the Kenyan people, but uh, most of these monies that have been set aside, just like the Amazon and the mission, always land in the private pockets of a few politicians in our country. So it's important to make the current regime has uh, in the in eight months that they have been in government, they have confirmed to the Kenyan people that they are not just acting in the interest of the Kenyan people, but they are only a regime that is puppet of, uh, particularly, the United States imperialism. And I could give you an example. It's um, a policy of, um, of intervention, imperialist intervention, supporting imperialist intervention in, in Haiti. One of them. Remember, just when President uh, Ruto became uh, was inaugurated, the first is that was the Western Sahara Embassy here because Morocco had given Kenya some free fertilizer. What fertilizer diplomacy? At the moment, remember, President Ruto has signed in into the mission. Uh, to support Ukraine um, with um, the help of the United States and other countries. And uh, in other policies that can only confirm that President Ruto to date is only a stooge of the, only a stooge of the uh, dominance class in the West. And all the policies that he's driving into has nothing to do with any progressive agenda. In fact, he is he the, the um, Haiti intervention is not just about being on the wrong side of history and supporting imperial interest. In fact, it is an illegal, you know, it's an illegal uh, intervention even within the national 
constitution country. And um, this has been, the, the Kenyan, you know, have pronounced themselves very clearly by giving conservatory orders and even confirming them that any deployment of the case force to auto prince is an illegality that is actually incurable because first of all we do not have any uh, in, in in range of security or mutual benefits with the Haiti government but there has been a propaganda debate to try and promote this imperialist intervention as a pan-Africanist intervention. In fact, President talks as if, you know, the deployment of the Kenya Police Service to Auto Prince will actually further the interest of the black population. Because according to him, using the the Kenyan population in Auto Prince try and further United States in interest and not just united states the core group interest um, and other countries is tested to continue to rob uh, you know to rob it they themselves do not want to put the they would rather prefer to use an outpost like an imperialist um, you know agent uh, like a black imperialist agent to try and generate a new debate that um, it's a black face standing, you know, uh, this this kind of interest. So uh, we we don't consider that this is a popular a popular, uh, you know, does this intervention does not enjoy a popular support among the Kenyan people. In fact, there are actions to challenge this President Ruto's decision. It's uh, the Kenyan people who wants the. Kenya police to be to IT, but it is only a few members of the ruling class that, that they're going to direct intervention that continue to insist on this illegality. You know, I'm curious when it comes to Kenya, uh, it's often portrayed in very positive terms by the U.S. as like a kind of ideal country in Africa, a sort of model for what other countries should be like. And of course, we know that, you know, Kenya has its place in the imperial order and it does often ally with the U.S. And, you know, I know at least in the Middle East, when it comes to countries that ally with the U.S., the idea is if you just submit and act like these countries, you can have a stable, successful country um, like the Gulf states. When in fact, in the Middle East, when you look at a lot of the countries that are client states of the U.S. or have normalized with Israel and all of these things, um, they actually still are quite poor and suffer from a lot of the same problems as everybody else in the region. So I'm just curious, is Kenya this ideal, like wonderful place because it sort of has this higher role in the U.S. imperial hierarchy uh, than other African countries or, you know, and like, for example, doing this this thing with Haiti? Uh, does that actually benefit the people of Kenya in the long term? Or does Kenya still have a lot of the same issues as the rest of the developed world? Developing world, sorry. Uh, um, it has to be you know, like Kenya is actually the belly of imperialism in Africa. Mm. In, in actually the horn of Africa. That is where the imperialist agents actually organized. This is uh, Mossad, the CIA, and um, and the formerly known. Scotland Yard is headquartered in one of Africa, and Kenya has been used, um, you know, to further the uh, imperialist interest. With them. And they consider it as, you know, they continue to shower Kenya with praises. They have been able to use Kenya strategically to even destabilize um, uh, other countries within the within the, the region. And eight, uh, the imperialists want to, you know, to run a mock in in the Horn of Africa. They always uh, Kenya to be the to the to be the mission uh, to advance what they are calling uh, a peaceful. Remember, Kenya was appointed to lead the peace mission in Sudan. Uh, Kenya 
I was appointed to lead the peace mission in Ivory Coast uh, and um, in South Sudan, even now in Congo. But those peace missions, the so-called peace missions, are not really to the interest of the African people. These are Kenya being used, uh, you know, to further imperialist interests. In terms of, uh, uh, I think imperialism, particularly United States imperialism, suffered, uh, you know, uh, in the last 10 years, particularly between uh, 2000 and, um, and uh, 13, 22, there has been a problem um, with the United States policies in our country. And if you look at the period, you realize that the, 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 the government of Kenya uh, was very deliberate in terms of East uh, than West. But that can be explained in our historical context that that progressive policies in the last, in those 10 years, that passed by when 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 President Jomo Kenyatta, the Uhuru Kenyatta, the son of Jomo Kenyatta, was in the presidency, was not by plan, but just because the United States are threatened to be tried and uh, jailed in the Hague, so you realize that in those ten years we had progressive policies in foreign policies, not domestic policy. But the United States government um, uh, uh, had been scheming to try out uh, those progressive policies. And that is why we can confirm that those 10 years, they managed to hone, finance, and assist uh, pres the current President Ruto, not just uh, financially, materially, but even to try and um, manipulate our electoral as well, that they had a perfect stooge uh, in State House. And that is why the, you can see the President Ruto is trying a lot to unroll all the progressive policies that actually were launched under Kenyatta's regime. In regard to development, um, our, 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 policies, our policies is highly influenced by by foreign players. And you cannot say that we are in success story because Kenya has quite a bit of wealth, but that wealth is in the hands of a few people. And even those few hold the wealth are, are mainly a comprado class that are holding this wealth on behalf of their international you know, partners. So in essence, um, we can see that our, our economic uh, uh, arrangement in our, uh, is, is not internally looking, but it's, uh, it's, it's externally looking. Remember, President, uh, President Ruto, when, it ca when he came to power, the first thing he did was to remove all safety nets that protect the poor people. And this is part of the... the austerity measure that was imposed upon the Kenyan people in 1990s by the Britain Wood institutions, particularly World Bank and IMF. So remember, every subsidy was placed on basic products was the first thing to suffer under the President Ruto's administration. Now, they are carrying, again, they are carrying out the most backward uh, economic policy in our country, being private affected by the IMF and World Bank. They have just done a, a currency devaluation. So remember, Kenya shillings now on free fall. Our economy is not based on any fundamental of agriculture and manufacturing, but we are a service economy managing and importing cheap and even sometimes substandard goods that is produced outside. But we do not have uh, a resilient agricultural or even um, a manufacturing base. So about Kenya being an example of, um, uh, of a successful story in East Africa is only a public relations exercise that is being conducted by 
the you know the ruling class in the global crime and um, you know spread an illusion about liberal democracy because even at the moment even if we enter democracy it is now clear that only the rich politicians can win elections in our country it's basically voter bribery exercise and nothing based on certain program uh, programs that could benefit the majority of the Kenyan people Oh, Eugene, you're muted, I think. Well, I guess it's not really something you can... <laughs> I can't hear you. No, Eugene. It's not just me, right? Oh, no, Eugene has been silenced. This is horrific. <laughs> well, while we get sorted out, Booker, I want to thank you for joining us. I think that's what Eugene was going... Uh, I assume that's what Eugene was going to say. He was going to thank you for joining us. Uh, National Vice Chairperson and National Organizing Secretary of the Communist Party of Kenya. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, and we hope that we will continue to advance uh, the cause for majority in the globe. Bye-bye. So, Eugene, do we hear you now? Wow, Eugene just kept... <laughs> All right, welcome to the freedom side, you guys. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure if we should move to the next guest or wait to get this odd. I feel like we need to get this audio situation. You want me to move to the next guest, Eugene? All right, well, we do have the next guest as we get Eugene's audio situation figured out. Free, hashtag free Eugene's voice. Let's get it going, guys. I want that trending. In the meantime... We want to lay, uh, welcome our next guest to the show, Leanne Sima Falehan, the Educational Director at the People's Forum and editor of 1804 Books. Leanne, welcome to the Freedom Side. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, I'm so relieved we can hear you. It's good to see you, Leanne. Um, it's good to have you on. I think we're still working on Eugene's audio. Hopefully we can hear him at some point. But Leanne, um, Israel's genocide has just, I mean, it's today's February 8th. So yesterday was exactly four months uh, since this genocide uh, began. We're literally entering the fifth month. We're at over 28,000 Palestinians killed, uh, over 10,000 children. I believe uh, something like 70,000 people have been injured. Uh, and we've seen recent diplomatic efforts by the U.S., Egypt, and the Qataris uh, to try to push towards some sort of negotiated temporary halt, temporary ceasefire, leading to maybe something more permanent in the future. But so far, uh, that proposal has failed uh, in securing anything permanent. We know that you know Hamas released its offer yesterday. Uh, giving conditions for basically ending the siege on Gaza. It actually was a very detailed uh, ceasefire proposal. The Israelis have basically rejected it at this point. Um, so I'm curious, what are your thoughts? What do you have to say about the viability of the various proposals on the table and what it means for the people of Gaza, for the people of Palestine? Well, I think we have to be very conscious of the fact that these negotiations are quite complex and that the media is playing a huge role in shaping the way that it's being communicated uh, to those who are not at the negotiating table. If we actually, actually look at the two proposals, the one that was hashed out in Paris between Israel, the U.S., Qatar, and Egypt, and then we look at Hamas's proposal in response, uh, one, we can be very clear that the Paris proposal was an Israeli proposal, and it certainly was not a ceasefire proposal. If we look at the contents of it and what it was actually saying, it provide no me provided no mechanisms for actually establishing a ceasefire uh, and ending the war. The Hamas proposal did lay out what those conditions would be. They specified some of the very vague uh, gestures, gestures in the uh, Paris proposal. Um, they specified numbers of prisoners. They specified stages for the withdrawal of the Israeli army with the goal of full withdrawal from the occupied Gaza territory uh, and uh, laid out conditions for moving from one phase to another. They both had three phases, um, but in Hamas's proposal, 
laid out the condition for moving from the first to the second phase being the completion of negotiations that would have a complete cessation of military operations on both sides. And so essentially, you know, despite the way the narrative is, uh, you know, Israel is saying that Hamas is making ludicrous demands right now and that there's no way that they could even consider uh, accepting any of them when really the Paris proposal itself was simply not a ceasefire agreement. And what Hamas did was propose a ceasefire to, agreement. So uh, we have to look at it in it in the actual content of what was being proposed on both sides. Um, Israel is not willing, it seems that their position right now, at least publicly, is not willing to pause the military operations. Uh, they are threatening and they've already been, been bombarding Rafah, where over two million people are seeking refuge. Um, there's worldwide concern over this because if what we saw in the rest of the the past four months wasn't horrific enough, now we have two million people who are displaced with without the conditions necessary for survival um, and bombardments being threatened on them as well. Um, and uh, and in this context, Israel is backing away from even the negotiation, the negotiating table. Um, so it's really a concerning situation. Well, I don't know if you can hear me, Leanne. We can. Yes. Eugene's Great. voice has been freed. Thank goodness. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's, it, I mean, it really, it's hard to even really fathom. I mean, seeing the attacks on Rafa, it, one of the things that people have been talking about for some time now is, you know, <laughs> I don't even know why we're questioning this, whether or not the actual Israeli plan is to push all Palestinians who they don't kill out of Gaza. And I mean, it really feels like that is what they've reverted to by rejecting the ceasefire. And then, I mean, people can't go any further south at this point. So, I mean, it really does feel that, you know, there's, there's the mask is totally off for anyone who couldn't see it yet, that this is an ethnic cleansing operation. That's Definitely true. I mean, they're insisting now that they achieve military victory over Hamas, something that has been proven that they've been un unable to do. Their only military strategy at this point is to mass murder the entire population and to see if that's going to uh, stop the, mil the military infrastructure of the resistance movement, which does not only include Hamas. And we also have to be very clear about that. They have failed. They have managed to kill tens of thousands of Palestinians, majority children and women and civilians. Um, and they have damaged the majority of the infrastructure necessary for sustaining life in Gaza and still have not been able to achieve a military victory over Hamas. Uh, so basically Netanyahu is in a, in a lose-lose situation and he's choosing to go down with more, uh, more bloodshed, um, just trying to hope, it seems, my interpretation of it is that he's hoping that he can enforce military might and kind of last the endurance battle here. Um, but it really, you know, it's a losing position. The majority of the world opinion is certainly against what has happened over the past four months, but even more against now moving into Rafah. Um, U.S. officials are making statements saying they're extremely concerned that they will not back uh, any military operation in Rafah unless there's safeguards for civilian protections. We've seen that before. Uh, we've seen that Lincoln, it, it, you know, was after the first round of humanitarian truce kind of shifted his tone and was saying similar things. It led to no concrete withdrawal of support. It led to no actual, the U.S. has not actually used any of its political weight to limit or condition Israeli operations, even though they could. So I think we have to really take anything that Blinken says with a lot of salt, not just a grain of it. Um, but you can see just in the way that he's speaking and the way that he's trying to at least give an image of prioritizing negotiations, uh, that it's become a very unsustainable position to have, even for the United States. Um, so, you know, Israel's administration, Netanyahu, they're digging their heels in. They're about to commit now what is internationally accepted as continuing to commit genocide um, and take it even to another level. Uh, so it's really uh, a terrible situation and mostly characterized by the unwillingness of the Israelis to negotiate. And I think that's extremely important. Most of the time when you talk about, when you hear people talk about whether in the media or in intellectual spaces or in history spaces about the history of negotiations between Israel and Palestine, 
the mainstream narrative, at least from the U.S., is that it's the Palestinians who refuse to negotiate. And I'm sure that this is what they're going to try to, they're trying to twist this now by saying that Hamas is making unre unreasonable requests. It's really the Israelis who are completely unwilling to negotiate. They've made no actual proposal that would lead to any sort of ceasefire, and they're refusing to consider one that was brought to them. Yeah, you know, as far as I see it, uh, the Israelis are genocidal. They would eliminate every single person in Gaza one way or another if they could, and they will continue to do what they're doing until they're stopped. Uh, and so it really does come down to pressure from the outside. There's no internal anything in Israel that will make this stop. I mean, the U.S. is obviously the most powerful force that can. There's also various groups in the region that are putting pressure on Israel, whether we're talking about Lebanon's Hezbollah or the Yemenis or the Iraqis. What's incredible about the U.S. position here is not only have they basically said, you know, without saying it this way, but they're essentially saying, you can do whatever you want in Gaza. We literally won't. There's nothing we won't defend Israel doing in Gaza. But we want to keep it contained there. We want to keep it contained to Gaza. But you've got all these groups across the region saying over and over and over again, we're not going to stop firing at your bases. And we're not going to stop firing at the Israelis and stopping ships that are going to Israel until this genocide ends. And so it's like there's the bigger issue or it becomes a re more regional issue when we talk about the idea of escalation. And now we've reached a point where you have Biden bombing Iraq, bombing Syria, bombing Yemen. And of course, this entire time, there's been the potential for a massive escalation in Lebanon, which has already had a war in the South. The Israelis every day are threatening to go to Lebanon next, even today. You know, they're prepared. So, Leanne, you know, what do you have to say about the risk of regional war here? Well, for as much as what the, it's exactly right the way you've laid it out, Rania, for as much as the way the U.S. would like to keep it contained, as they say, uh, they are actually the main ones escalating. Uh, the U.S. in partnership with the U.K. has been bombing hundreds of sites now uh, for the past, over the past week, more than that, um, in retaliation for what they're saying is the attack on Tower 22. We have to understand that there's been many attacks on U.S. bases over the past period and before that, because the people in the region from most factions and most uh, sectors of society and across the political spectrum do not want the U.S. military presence there. I mean, um, I was listening to an interview with some uh, people from the Council on Foreign Relations recently, and they openly admitted, uh, Robin White openly admitted that if the U.S. leaves Syria, then the Syrian Democratic Forces who have control over the oil in Syria would not be able to keep control of it. And so, I mean, it's really... The U.S. is still there as a malicious force that is controlling the resources of the region, that is keeping a, a, a situation of political and military chaos going and not allowing for there to be a process that would actually resolve many of the, of the issues that were caused by the various U.S. invasions in the region. And so military bases have been um, receiving a variety of different attacks even though, of course, they are much more militarily superior, but have been receiving attacks. And what happened on Tower 22 was admitted by the U.S. media. It was uh, a mistake on behalf of those who were monitoring the defense systems of that base, and they, they didn't realize what was coming. And, and so this attack did land um, and did cause loss of life. And so they're using it now uh, to justify a huge escalation over 100 bombings of various sites that has taken out also civilians across Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. Um, and all the while trying to say that they are uh, bombing discrete kind of these rebel forces, military infrastructure. They don't understand that, especially in places like Yemen, uh, you cannot isolate the, the Ansar Allah movement from the masses of people in Yemen. Uh, they are actually representing a force, uh, a mass force that is committed to real solidarity with the Palestinian cause. And it's not just isolated to one or the other group. And this movement itself is not actually uh, a discrete political movement. It includes many different political uh, uh, people from different political organizations and, and identities. Uh, so it really is the U.S. that is escalating because when you when you attack a people, then the, you get a response from the people. It is the United States that is making United States and Israel that is um, 
pushing the conflict to go beyond the borders of the occupied Palestinian territories. And uh, I think we have to be very alert to that. It's something that I think many people inside the White House administration don't want to deal with. It's distracting them from their larger goals, which is pivoting towards China, trying to maintain global hegemony in other spheres, and they're getting dragged down into the Arab region. Um, but their words and actions are not lining up. Briefly, before we let you go, Leanne, uh, you know, how do you evaluate the state of the worldwide storm of protests we've seen against this genocide? Well, they're still going very strong, despite what uh, I think people maybe have hoped from the White House and the ruling class across the world. Um, they had hoped that people would get kind of tired, that the news cycle would shift, that you know there would be demobilization. Here in the U.S., we've seen a wave of police repression on the very right to protest in New York City, where I'm based. The police have basically come up and have decided that people do not have a right to protest anymore, not in anywhere, not have rallies, not use sound, not take the streets. Um, but they're coming up against a force now, a, a organic force that is not only committed to the cause for Palestine and has decided to be in this for the long run, but how has had the training of the past four months and is much more organized, knows how to organize protests, uh, knows how to withstand different uh, types of repression, whether it's media, whether it's political, whether it's police. And so the attempts, I think, to repress the movement for Palestine are not going to be successful. Uh, the, on top of it, the Democratic Party in particular has basically lost its base of support over this issue. Um, most Democratic Party officials who have not said something in, in favor of a ceasefire are now basically being followed around every single day by people who are making it very clear to them that they are supporters of genocide, that they are they they are indicted, in fact, with supporting genocide, as long as they do not use their position in the White House to put pressure on the Biden administration and to uh, push the United States to use its extreme influence to restrain the Israelis and to answer the demands of their own population. And it's also been very interesting. I just want to say one last thing is that, you know, a lot of people were activated by this by this latest genocidal assault. But in the process over these past four months, as people have you know, built with each other and investigated more the situation, a lot of people have moved from simply just demanding a ceasefire to demanding an end of the Israeli occupation overall. And so I think that what has started in since October uh, unfortunately for Biden and his friends, is here to stay in the long term beyond any version of a negotiated ceasefire uh, and until there is greater justice for the Palestinian people. So mm -hmm. on the, that is one very optimistic thing in the situation and, and hopefully I, I believe we'll continue to strengthen uh, as, as things move on and develop. Fantastic. Well, Leanne Foulihan, Education Director at the People's Forum and Editor at 1804 Books, as always, really appreciate you joining us here on the Freedom Side. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Rania? Well, Eugene, I mean, what more is there to say? I think we, we got it covered, Free Free Palestine. Yeah, well, excellent. Good transition. Well, we are going to move here now to the U.S. Congress and the ongoing attempts to push forward this new Cold War through the uh, lens of social media. Uh, there was a big hearing uh, the, on the Hill. I guess it was last week, earlier this week. My mind is uh, losing me here. But recently it took place. There was a hearing. Uh, if you maybe missed it, there are a number of notable sure. moments. But we have a clip of one of the more notable viral moments, which I think will give you a sense of how the whole thing went. Of what nation are you a citizen? Singapore. Are Senator. you a citizen of any other nation? No, Senator. Have you ever applied for Chinese citizenship? Senator, I serve my nation I'm in asked, Singapore. I, no, I, I did not. Do you have a Singaporean passport? Yes, and I served my military for two, two and a half years in Singapore. Do you, have any other, do you have any other passports from any other nations? No, Senator. Your wife is an American citizen. Your children are American citizens. That's have correct. You, have you ever applied for American citizenship? Not, no, not yet. Have you ever been a member of the Chinese Communist Party? Senator, I'm Singaporean. No. Have you ever been associated or affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party? No, Senator. Again, okay. I'm Singaporean. Let me ask you some. 
before I say too much to discuss all of this, let's bring in Amanda Yee, who is a journalist and managing editor of Liberation News. Amanda, thanks so much for being back with us. (laughs) Thanks thanks again for having me. It's great to be back. Well, it's always great to have you. I I guess, let me just ask your thoughts. I mean, what, what do you think about that exchange and what it represents? Well, so I saw, so the uh, Senate hearing was last Wednesday, January 31st. And um, right after the hearing, um, I saw that particular clip of Tom Cotton um, circulating on social media. And I really thought it was an old clip and I couldn't figure out why it was going viral because I really thought this was um, a clip from last year's TikTok house hearing, you know, in which... Uh, you know, they brought out the CEO of TikTok and they kind of um, regaled him with uh, all these sorts of different types of questions, um, basically uh, connecting him to the Chinese or the Communist Party of China and asking him about his thoughts on um, the Uyghurs and Xinjiang, asking him about um, the situation in Tibet. But, you know, I was surprised that this was actually a separate hearing. Um, It was the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing um, entitled Big Tech and the Online Child Sexual Exploitation Crisis. Um, And, you know, um, Xu Jiqi, who's the CEO of TikTok, he was one of a handful of big tech CEOs who were brought before this hearing um, to testify before the Senate committee. Um, and it was basically a, a hearing in which, um, you know, in the audience, there were family members of children who had been victims of this kind of harmful content that uh, is being pushed by social media. And some of these children had been victims of sexual predators online. Some of them had been driven to suicide due to their being fed content, which promoted suicide. Um, Some had developed eating disorders because that's what they were getting fed through their feeds, right? And so um, it's basically a kind of political theater where the um, where the capitalist class pretends to go after these big tech companies in lieu of passing any kind of comprehensive privacy legislation and like really properly regulating the industry. Um, And so uh, they brought the CEO of TikTok to this hearing um, to be questioned, but they also brought the CEO of Snapchat. They brought the CEO of Meta, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, They brought the uh, CEO of Discord and they brought the CEO of X, the new one, not Elon Musk, but the new one. So, you know, it it was kind of a way to advance this new Cold War on China. But there are actually like a couple of different uh, far right agendas that was being pushed through this. Um, one of it, which is, you know, as you can see, was the McCarthyite fear mongering around China and um, the tech war against it. Um, but basically central to this hearing was this piece of legislation called the Kids Online Safety Act. Um, and it's a piece of legislation that would basically regulate the type of content that companies can show minors online. And it grants the Federal Trade Commission and state attorneys like basically any kind of general power to enforce these rules as laid out by the Kids Online Safety Act. Um, So the bill would create kind of a duty for social media platforms to prevent and mitigate any kind of harm to minors, um, including a censoring content that would promote self-harm, suicide, eating disorders, substance abuse, and sexual exploitation. And it would mandate tech companies to limit access or allow minors to opt out of certain features, um, like opt out of automatic video playing and opt out of um, like certain algorithmic recommendations. Um, And the bill would legally obligate tech platforms to prevent the promotion of content about certain topics such as suicide, eating eating disorders, and self-harm. And this bill is actually like pretty controversial because like a lot of legislation that's presented as a way to protect children and families, um, it's actually being used as um, this kind of Trojan horse 
that's intended to target LGBTQ people. Um, so a lot of online rights advocates that this measure would disproportionately restrict LGBTQ content um, and categorize it as um, sexually, like as sexual content that's inappropriate for children. Um, and this, like LGBTQ content currently uh, is already you know, regularly shadow banned on these kinds of social media platforms. Um, and some have also argued that, that this bill would also censor educational content about racism, like under the claim that this, that that type of content negatively impacts kids' mental health. Um, and so, you know, this is a bill that is pushed and co-sponsored by uh, Marsha Blackburn, who has been very vocal about uh, being like anti-LGBTQ. Um, and also, if you look at the bill's endorsers, you definitely get a sense that there is an underlying agenda here, right? Um, among the bill's endorsers are the American Principles Project, which is a right-wing think tank that opposes same-sex marriage. It opposes the teaching of critical race theory and LGBTQ content in schools. Um, and the, the objective of that think tank is to eliminate trans healthcare entirely, right? And so in the bill's current form, it's also endorsed by right-wing think tank, the Heritage Foundation, which um, in September of 2022, released a report entitled, like, How Big Tech Turns Kids Trans, right? Um, and so... The Heritage Foundation actually objected to an earlier form of this bill in September of 2022, and it stated that it didn't go far enough in restricting um, LGBT co LGBTQ content. Um, and it's also endorsed by like other far-right groups like the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, which is this Christian fundamentalist group that has campaigned against LGBTQ rights and sex education in schools. Um, it's endorsed by the America First Policy Institute, um, which, you know, like given its name, you can kind of guess how it, how it stands on LGBTQ rights and trans rights. Um, so there's a lot, there's like a couple of different far right agendas being pushed here. Um, one important thing to note is that this kind of war that's being manufactured by the far right, um, you know, and how it's being used as a wedge to divide the working class, it's actually, that agenda is actually deeply unpopular among Americans. And a lot of but Americans are more concerned with like economic issues like inflation, skyrocketing rent and basic necessities, um, sending billions of dollars to fund a genocide in Gaza, that um, those are the issues that they're really concerned about. Um, and so the culture war agenda pushed by the far right um, isn't really working. So they're resorting to these like more oblique kinds of attacks that don't really look like they're targeting LGBTQ people, but in fact, that's their purpose and goal. So in addition to like the McCarthyite theater, there is like an additional like far right agenda being pushed through these uh, congressional hearings. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you breaking that all down. I'm actually curious because I don't know the answer to this. I just, I'm, I'm reminded of, um, a couple months ago, Nikki Haley said the most insane thing with regard to TikTok because it mm. kind of just seems like they're just kind of throwing whatever's out there and seeing what sticks, like at least for the public to follow. Like you mm -hmm. said, they have to like sort of hide this stuff and this other rhetoric. Um, yeah. I, so I'm just going to quote her because it was so crazy. It actually had to do with Gaza. She said back in uh, this is in December, so just not that long ago, we really need to ban TikTok once and for all. And let me tell you why. For every 30 minutes that someone watches TikTok, every day they become 17% more anti-Semitic, more pro-Hamas based on doing that. I like that that was such a specific number. Like she literally just made that up. Like I, it wasn't even like some mm -hmm. right-wing study that they came out and they were like, we found that people are 17. She just completely fabricated this number. But I'm just, I'm curious if this bill does anything to refer to like the whole, you know, weaving together the anti-Semitism, anti-Israel stuff with uh, yeah. the anti-China stuff. I have no idea if it does or not. Yeah, it's really interesting um, because I watched, uh, like the whole hearing was like several hours long, so I couldn't watch all of it, but I watched the uh, parts where the CEO of TikTok, Shuji Chi, right? And um, 
one of the people that interrogated him was Lindsey Graham, right? And he how um, the TikTok representative in Israel resigned recently because supposedly, you know, this was his claim that um, TikTok spreads pro Hamas content, and the app is being used to help people destroy the Jewish state. That's a that's a quote from Lindsey Graham that TikTok is being used to help people destroy the Jewish state. So um, last year we had this like um, like all this red scare propaganda around China, but now since October seventh, um, we've had you know a different red scare emerging, where um, you know basically if you don't completely fall in line with Israel um, and Israel's genocide in Gaza, that marks you as a terrorist terrorist sympathize. So it was really interesting to see like people like Lindsey Graham at this um, congressional hearing kind of merge the two um, red scares into one, like the China red scare yeah. with the new anti-Semitism uh, Israel red scare. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, the, the hearing itself was very similar to what we saw in March, right? With a lot of the same kind of questioning. Um, the CEO had to field the same questions about uh, him being from China. Like there were several members of Congress who would repeatedly ask him, you know, are you a member of the Communist Party of China? Uh, are you a citizen of China? Do you intend to become a citizen of China? And he like basically responded the same every time. Like, no, I am from Singapore. Um, I live in Singapore. I was born in Singapore. And um, I guess not a lot of people are familiar with the fact that S Singapore is an entirely different country. Like it's not China. It's actually like its own separate country, 2000 miles South of China and like surrounded my Malaysia. Right. Um, and you know, just like, uh, you know, the hearings last March, um, he had to field questions about him, uh, you know, his thoughts on, the supposed Uyghur genocide in Xinjiang, what he thought about the Tiananmen Square protests. Um, uh, there was someone who asked him if he agreed that uh, Xi Jinping was a dictator. Um, and, you know, one of the more viral moments that came out of last year's hearing was uh, just like the basic lack of knowledge that uh, these Congress members displayed uh, in terms of like how apps work, how technology worked, um, how algorithms work, right? If you remember, there was a clip going viral last year of Representative Richard Hudson from North Carolina asking Chu if TikTok could access your home Wi-Fi or other de devices connected to the home Wi-Fi network, right? Um, this time, Senate members demonstrated the same lack of understanding of how these apps work. Um, one example of this was during his questioning, Ted Cruz accused uh, TikTok of repressing content that was critical of China by like selectively comparing, you know, these completely unrelated hashtags and how they were trending over select periods of time, right? So Cruz, uh, like, Cruz's argument was predicated upon comparing hashtags for the Hong Kong protests, Tibet, Tiananmen Square, and Xinjiang, and um, comparing those hashtags to hashtags for Taylor Swift, and then accusing TikTok <laughs> of repressing the former because they hadn't achieved like the same level of uh, like virality as Taylor Swift over this like very specific period of time. And that was his evidence that like TikTok was deliberately trying to repress intent that was critical of China, right? Mm -hmm. Um and, you know, Chu also had to, like, feel these different allegations um, from people like Josh Hawley, who's, you know, one of these, like, really vocal America first isolation been elevating uh, over a war with China for a really long time. Um, feels more questions that 
China was able to access American user data through this app, right? Um, Holly accused TikTok of being basically an espionage arm for the Chinese Communist Party. Um, Holly said, you know, like every single one of these Americans are in danger from the fact that TikTok tracks their employees, TikTok tracks their app usage, TikTok tracks their location data. And he said, we know that all of that information can be accessed by Chinese employees who are subject to the dictates of the Chinese Communist Party, right? Um, so, you know, obviously there are a lot of serious questions to be had about like data privacy and the way that algorithms push what we see on social media. But this singling out of Chu and TikTok in particular um, and baselessly alleging that the, CP that the CPC harvests American users' data and that it dictates the content on our feeds, um, that is, I mean, that's just nothing more than Red Scare propaganda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 100%. Uh, one quick thing before we let you go, Amanda. I mean, you know, one other element of this vis-a-vis -vis sort of the U.S.-China competition, I feel, uh, and I'm just sort of asking your thoughts on this maybe, is – you know, the fact that TikTok is successful. I mean, whether we're talking about chips, whether we're talking about electric vehicles, it almost seems like part of this is sort of like we have to take down TikTok because more and more Americans prefer TikTok to these American companies and it's eroding our, you know, the economic hegemony, so to speak. And there's kind of like a kneecapping aspect to it. I wonder what you think about that. No, that's 100% true. Um, the U.S. tech war on China is this key front on the, in the new Cold War, and it comprises another major component of this containment strategy that the U.S. government has taken toward China. And it has different components, right? There's the military aspect of it, of containment, where the U.S. government is like basically encircling it with like U.S. military bases around the South China Sea and then like just sending an unlimited supply of weapons to arm Taiwan. And then there's this economic isolation com component of containment where the U.S. is targeting Chinese tech companies like TikTok, like Huawei, um, through the use of sanctions, right? And so the Biden administration wants Chinese ownership to sell TikTok or face a possible ban. And the fundamental issue here, like you said, is that ByteDance is a Beijing-based company um, and they built TikTok and it, they built it to become the most popular and most frequently downloaded app worldwide, right? And so the sanctioning of, uh, you know, the Chinese tech giant Huawei, the moves to ban TikTok, it's all part of this U.S. digital containment strategy of China. And it's trying to block its access to key markets in the U.S. Um, and just like with Huawei, the U.S. is pushing for its allies to ban TikTok. You know, um, India has already imposed a nationwide ban. It went through within 2020. Um, the U.K., the Netherlands, Norway, France, Canada and Australia they have all moved to ban the app from government-issued devices. Um, and the U.S. is doing this because in its Made in China 2025 plan, the Communist Party of China like basically laid out that technological innovation is central to its economic development. So this strategy held that it was like technical, technological advances that would transform China from this kind of semi-peripheral like manufacturing hub for cheap goods um, to one of high-end manufacturing um, and innovation in the global supply chain, right? And so central to this plan is the goal of China developing its own domestic firms so that it can no longer rely or it would no longer need to rely on foreign technology imports. So as advances in chip technology kind of revolutionize breakthroughs in other areas, the semiconductor industry is like considered pivotal to this plan. And so these semiconductors or chips are used in consumer electronics, um, like televisions and computers and game consoles. And China spends more on importing these types of chips than it does oil. And so recognizing China's reliance on chip manufacturing, Biden has really tried to block access in order to blunt the rise of China's tech sector. So in October of 2022, Biden introduced all of these like sweeping bans on semiconductor exports to China. And then in January of last year, um, you know, he reached agreements with like the Netherlands and Japan and other U.S. allies to restrict their exports of chip making equipment to China. Right. 
Um, and so this strategy of tech containment isn't really unique to the current administration. Trump did it too. Trump tried to cut off Huawei's access to Google Music and other smartphone services. And then he later followed up with new sanctions on American technology um, to China, right? And so, you know, it's important to note that Huawei is Apple's biggest competitor in China. It like recently per surpassed the iPhone as the number one smartphone there. Um, but before that, in 2022, Huawei's annual profits had actually plunged by 70% due to U.S. sanctions and like due to the U.S. foreclosing its market access, right? So, um, you know, this ban or this attempted ban on, on TikTok is like all part of this larger picture, right? So, of course, the political theater of this like McCarthyite questioning of um, the TikTok CEO and the threats of the ban threats of a ban of the app, or like Biden trying to force Chinese ownership to sell the app, um, it should be understood as part of like this larger tech containment strategy and as like another step toward cutting off Chinese tech from accessing this like key U.S. market. Um, and it's just a strategy where the U.S. is trying to further hinder China's economic development. Mm -hmm. Well, as always, very happy to have you here, Amanda. If you're just joining in, we were talking to Amanda Yee, journalist and managing editor of Liberation News. As always, thanks for giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Rania? Well, Eugene. Mm -hmm. Yeah? China. <laughs> just China. That's all. I just, just China. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I feel no, like you can actually, it's like a winning important. slogan. And um, that, that could be a winning slogan right now. You could just be like, China. That's 90% of Rania. the Republican I'm campaigns, it I'm seems, running these days. for this office. Yeah. yeah. No, it yeah. really is. Uh, it's really amazing. I mean, just even see, I mean, you know, obviously the CEO of TikTok is a Chinese descended person, of which many of whom live all around the world. There's 60 million Chinese descended people all around the world. So this like constant intonation, it's like, you know, I saw all these Republicans trying to like, come back on it, you know, and be like, oh, well, do you think only Chinese people are members of the Chinese Communist Party? Well, actually, if you know anything about the Chinese Communist Party, it's actually famously true. Uh, and it's like very, very few people who have played big roles in Chinese history who have been inducted as non-Chinese people into the party as like a sign of how much the Chinese people appreciate them because um, they take it very seriously. But obviously it's meant to be like, well, doesn't this guy look Chinese? So he must be lying when he's yes. saying all these other things. But yeah. he's it's certainly like I'm from Singapore, you know, but it just shows like the racism of the whole thing, the total misunderstanding Absolutely. of diasporic politics of any country. And just honestly, these people like the Josh Hollies of the world and the Tom Cottons know exactly what they're doing. They're not ignorant. Um, they know exactly what they're stoking, exactly what they're trying to gen up in people's minds. And it's, it's honestly disgusting. But, um, you know, one other thing I wanted to quickly mention, Rania, before we close is, uh, you know, Booker we had on from Kenya. There was a great interview with him in uh, People's Dispatch, which is, you know, one of our close friends here recently. It's called We Will Fight in the Streets of Nairobi for Our Brothers and Sisters in Haiti. Uh, that's uh, an interview on peoplesdispatch.org with uh, Booker Amole, who we had on from the Kenya Communist Party. But great uh, extra context there for, for that story, which I think is a really important one uh, about how people in Kenya are, are standing with the people of Haiti. So just wanted to mention that before, before we ended the show. Yeah, no, definitely. People's Dispatch, if you're not subscribed to it, if you're not checking it every day, you should be. It's a fantastic outlet run by uh, our very own uh, guest. Uh, wow, I really can't. Yeah. It is What's forth. important is that Zoe Alexandra, who often is with us on wow, the show. I just uh, butchered is, that so bad. Dispatch. I pray Zoe's not watching. Also, I think it's okay. It's the thought love, that counts. Sorry, I think Zoe. She'll credit you. <laughs> sorry, Zoe. Yeah. Well, nonetheless, Anyways. it is great. Peoplesdispatch.org. So check that out and check out everything. Well, Rania, as always, this brings us to the end of the show. Anything you would like to say to our viewers on the way out? Yes. Matt, play it so I don't have to say it. Smash, 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 smash that like button. Yes! What she said. I love that. That was like the best edit ever. Mm. Smash that like button, you guys. It helps us in the algorithm. Also, make sure you're subscribed to Breakthrough News on all social media platforms. We're on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, at BT Newsroom. And you can support 
Breakthrough News by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com slash Breakthrough News, where you can access exclusive content and very cool merch. Um, yeah, I think I said it all, Eugene. I think so. Uh, Rania, as a Taylor Swift fan, you now have to care about football. So do you want to give any uh, Super Bowl predictions here? That is untrue. I'm not going to start caring about football because Taylor Swift is dating a football player. However, if I did have any predictions, don't listen to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. Thank you. <laughs> I think Thank that's you. definitely true. Uh, I appreciate that you're not changing uh, for anybody. But anyway, I thought I might be able to get some money off you, but I guess not. Nonetheless, uh, we will be back with you next week as we always are. And on behalf of our whole Breakthrough News team, we will see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.